This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Toll-free worldwide, 1-800-610-7035. My email is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, TV at Hotmail.com, and our website, www.XZoneRadioTV.com. Listen to this, Exxon Nation. This will give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about this hour. It is one of the most influential stories of all time that gave us literature's greatest villain. For a hundred years, we thought his story ended there. But now, he returns. Dracula, the Undead. From Bram Stoker's direct descendant, Dacre Stoker, and Dracula historian, Ian Holt, comes the heart-stopping sequel to the original classic. Based on Bram Stoker's own handwritten notes and extensive research. Dracula, the Undead. On October 13th, 2009, the legend lives. Joining me now is Ian Holt. And Ian, welcome to the X-Zone. Uh, I, I have to ask you, what is the fascination after all these years with Dracula? I think because um, he's a touchstone for all of us. I mean, mm-hmm. he's the first vampire we've encountered. Um, as children, we usually see the Bela Lugosi movie. Yes. One of the first vampire movies we see. Mm-hmm. Um, for people that are a little older, you know, they, they, the first vampire they ever heard of was Bela Lugosi. So uh, it becomes a touchstone, you know, and, the, and Rom's book is still um, a book that everyone looks to when they turn to vampires. You know, all the legends of turning into a, a bat and, and all the attributes of the vampire sucking the blood and all of that all come, all stem from that book. So it's kind of like the, uh, the Bible of vampires, you know. Sure. <laughs> it's... it's it's the uh, New Testament of vampires. But tell me, Ian, are vampires real, or are they folklore? Are they legend, or are they fiction? They are real. They are real vampires. But, you know, like a chicken and the egg, what came first, mm-hmm. real vampire or Brom? <laughs> you know, um, today there are real vampires out there today. There's a whole subculture. In fact, um, <clears throat> the head of the vampires lives in Paris. And his name is Father Sebastian. Why would a person want to become a vampire? Well, this is something, you, no matter what culture you, you can bring up, I mean, even the American Indians, mm-hmm. um, if you've ever seen the movie um, uh, A Ravenous, or heard of a shapeshifter in, in Indian legend, it's the eating of flesh, being a cannibal or or drinking blood of your enemy, uh, the Pawnee were known to do that. They you would you would drink eat the flesh of your enemy, and people said that you consume their soul and their power. And doing this over a long period of time, you were resistant to disease and 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 um, and had extra you extra human strength. And then eventually, you gained the power to uh, shift shift into wolves or deer or, or, or 
other types of animals. And uh, this is the legends that go way back hmm. um, in every culture. Uh, also, there's a negative connotation of, of vampires, naturally. Um, but in Europe, uh, there was, if you had, even even here, they even in America, in, in the colonies, there are graves that they've unearthed with vampires in them. They actually say on the gravestones, the shale carved in vampire. And the reason for that was the first person to uh, get a disease, let's say, tuberculosis, which was then known as consumption. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then everyone else in the family would get it. I was a witness to a staking of a real vampire in Romania. He actually dug up a body and put an iron rod through it. You know, what, the wooden stake isn't really the truth. The wooden stake had something to do with the wood of the cross and all that that came later, but in the legends. But All right. originally it was the iron rod to put through the body. Ian, stand by. Rod. We've got to take a two-minute commercial break. Ian Holt is our guest, Exonation, www.draculatheun-dead.com. That's Dracula, the un, and then a dash, dead.com. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial. Don't go away. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Are you interested in the paranormal, ghosts, UFOs, or psychic phenomenon? Join me, Tim Bartley, co-host of Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, coming mid-January 2017 to the XZBN. We will channel spirits live and talk to them, revealing all kinds of amazing information. Spiritual attachments will be found and removed on the show, and so much more. To find out when you can listen to Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, visit www.xzbn.net for listeners on both sides of the veil. Exxon Nation, Ian Holt is our guest. We're talking about Dracula this hour here in the Exxon. And where did your interest in Dracula come from, Ian? Well, you, you hit on a little bit of it with that song, The Monster Mash. Um, you know, when I was a kid, um, I, very young, mm -hmm. um, I was afraid of the monsters, the universal monsters, the Wolfman and, uh, and Frankenstein and Dracula. But I was a huge fan of Abbott Costello, so my dad got the idea of letting me watch Abbott Costello and me Frankenstein, and I could watch the monsters of the comedy. And I, you know, was hooked from then on. But the one that got me the most was Bella. And I think it was because he was the most human-looking mm -hmm. <laughs> out of them. You know, um, um, you know, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. Was, wasn't a monster when he was, was in makeup. So that doesn't really count. So it was Bella that really got to me. And I think, like, you know, a lot of people ask me, why vampires? Why does Dracula stick around with us or, or any vampires? And I think... You know, as you're an adolescent, you know, you're so not in control of your life. And you look at, at the, the vampire. He has the power of hypnotism. You know, he can make people do what he wants. Um, you know, when you're struggling with, you know, adolescence and you're trying to get the date, you want to have the captain of the cheerleading squad or the captain of the football team, you know, whatever your choice. And you, and you want, you know, you, you know, there's only one person that can date them in the whole school. But if you're Dracula, you, you can just <laughs> wave your fingers and all of a sudden a little hypnotism and 
and uh, they're dating you. Um, you know, if you need a best friend, you know, you don't have a friend, bite them on the neck, you know, and you got a friend for life. You know, I think Dracula is kind of who we wish to be. If you're stuck in traffic and some guy cuts you off, you want to pull him out of the car and, you know, in a little road rage. You can't do that because you're worried about the rule of law. Dracula doesn't have that problem. He yeah. has the strength of 20 men. Yeah. You know, he, if, you, if you send him to prison, he can bend the bars and get out, you know. Um, how can the police stop him? You know, bullets go right through him. I mean, you know, you want to, you're in trouble for cash, you mm-hmm. need to rob a bank. You know, we all have these fantasies, you know, and, and for most of us, they're just fantasies. For, for people, you know, like that are vampires, you know, not the real vampires, but of the movies, they have, the, they have all this power. You know, it's a great fantasy. And I think adolescents, because they're so not in control of their life, really connect with vampires. I mean, look at the Twilight craze. Mm-hmm. All right, Paul. You've got to separate fact from fiction at some time in your life. You just can't keep on pretending you're a vampire with all these powers when you're simply a mortal. True. But I think, you know, for a lot of people, you know, what, when they analyze the horror movie craze of the 80s, mm-hmm. why did um, the, uh, the slasher films go over so huge? Why is it that the virginal girl always winds up as the heroine of these movies, defeats the bad guy. I, I think it's, you know, almost like cathartic. You sit there and, you know, you're a geek in school. Well, you know, hey, I get to go watch these movies. The geek is the hero. Mm-hmm. The first one to always get killed is the, you know, the most popular kid in school or the bad kid in school that everybody likes. You know, um, I think that's all part of it. I think, you know, we become as kids, get into the the... the Praised this way, and then it becomes part of our lives. We were always interested in the vampire because it was something that we attached to in our youth. When we get older, so it's the idea that you don't have to, you know, have plastic surgery. You never grow old. You don't lose your hair. You know all these things that, and of course, a man's greatest fear is on mortality. You never die. You know, the, my favorite poster of all time is movie. Poster is a Lost Boys poster. Even though it's not my favorite vampire movie, the poster is my favorite. It says at the top of the poster, sleep all day, party all night, never grow old, never die. It's fun to be a vampire. And I think that sums it up as best as I've ever heard it. All right, so let's 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 just take a comparison between the fictional vampire, like okay. Dracula. Compared to the people in today's society who claim to be vampires, like, they're going to die. If they're shot, they're going to die. Uh, um, you know. I, I beg to differ. I mean, I, yes, they are going to die. But, uh, I ha- I, you know, we're doing a, putting together a, a reality show uh, about vampires. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the people that are going to be on is a woman who was a bodyguard for uh, I won't say, but one of the top rock stars in the world. She was shot four times, mm-hmm. she tells me. And these wounds should have killed her. She attributes her survival of those four gunshot wounds to her drinking blood. And that she's she's here today because she's a vampire. Was she born well, a vampire? I don't, know. I, I don't know, you know how much truth there is to uh-huh. But because I'm not a blood drinker, mm-hmm. but there are pe- the people who drink the blood, and now that this is not don't go out and get a victim, you know this is they have girlfriends and boyfriends or, or just acquaintances who give who give them the blood, and before you give the blood, you're screened for HIV and STDs and all of that, you know, um, that you you drink that blood, and you're uh, supposedly you you um, you you have you don't get sick. You don't get the flu every year. You don't get uh, colds. You, you, you're you stronger than an average person. You know, she claims she can bench more than most women, and she's not all bulked out, you know, and muscular like the um, like the, the uh, heavy bodybuilder women, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a woman, Michelle Belanger, who's an energy vamp, where they 
they put her on um, on a uh, infra, you know, a thermal camera. Yeah. And she sits with her girlfriend, and she runs her hands around the outside of the girlfriend, and you see she's almost has no registry. She's almost cold. She's almost at like death temperature. Mm-hmm. And the girlfriend has a full aura of energy, of heat around her. And as she runs her hands around her, the energy transfers from the girlfriend to Michelle. And you see Michelle's body warm up in the thermal cam, and the other girl get cold. And she, by the end, the girl, the girlfriend is completely tired, and Michelle is completely energized and alive, and she says she has to do this to live. So, I mean, you know... And that, that's easy to record. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it's recorded on the thermal camp. You sit there and you're going, you know, is there anything to this? And I'll tell you, this may be a little bit off topic, but there's a website called um, Black Ops or something like that, dot com. And on there they have studies that were done by the KGB that's been translated, all these freedom of information stuff from Russia, mm-hmm. where they found a tribe in South America when they were building the roads to the rainforest that had never seen people. Right. And they were eaters of their own dead to consume end of their enemies. Um, and they, they to consume the soul of the ancestors. Well, what's the difference between doing the that? What's the difference between doing that and being a cannibal then? There really is none. It's just that, um, you know, the person... In, in, in those cultures, they don't call mm-hmm. it cannibalism because you're not killing a person to eat them. The person dies of natural causes, and then you eat them. It's a very subtle difference. But, it, it, you know, for technical terms, you know, in science, they, use, they don't just call them actually cannibals. What use, the, what, the, what, what use does a cannibal have in today? I'm sorry, what use does a vampire have in today's society? And why would anyone in their right mind want to become a vampire? Like. Well, like, are you these know, are these starts, people psychologically starts, balanced? Are they missing something in their psyche? No, no. It comes from two things. One, there's an actual clinical disease. It's called Renfield syndrome, mm-hmm. named after Renfield from the book, where people, for some reason, uh, are mentally imbalanced and they they need to eat, drink blood. Uh, this is a, a psychological, real psychological. You know, a lot of these people who are like. Uh, Ed Gein and the serial killers mm-hmm. have Renfield syndrome. Um, there's another part of this that comes from vampires, goths, these groups, um, emos, all the stuff that they live outside the general society of what is acceptable society, a way to dress, and you know, and they have their own community. They don't care if you're fat. They don't care if you're thin. They don't care if you're ugly, if you have pimples. They don't care. They don't care how you dress. They don't care if you're rich or poor. If if you want to be down with them, and you, you are. And it's a way for people who are not the cool kids in school, the shy and the imperfect, mm-hmm. to find their own clique. And you're accepted. And when you get into it, you know, it's like any cult. And that's what it is. It's kind of a goth is a cult. You know, the goth kids and all of that. Uh, it, you can leave when you want. No one's taking your family's money like in a, in a in a cult. But you know, what if you're a Wiccan? You know, Wiccans have a lot to do with vampirism. Now, Wicca is white magic. I mean, it still uses the five point of pentagram, but it's it's straight up evil, like black magic and um, and the devil is an inverted pentagram, like an upside down cross. So. Um, a lot of people confuse Wicca for Satanism, but it, it, Wicca is just worshiping the goddess mother, which is the earth. They believe the earth is itself, you know, the the energy and the wellspring from which we, we, we come. So, uh, you know, uh, vampires and all that stuff, you, you get involved with it because they're accepting. They'll take you in. You know, it's the same psychological thing of why the gangs work. You know, the, the, the Bloods and the Crips and all the L.A. gangs and, you know, the Latin Kings and everybody else. You, it's a family situation where no matter what you are, they'll accept you. I think that has a lot to do with it. Stand by. You and I have to take our commercial break, Ian. Ian Holt is our sure. guest, Exxon Nation. www.draculatheun-dead.com. That's www.dracula, the un, then there's a hyphen, dead.com. 
This is the Exxon on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, Exxon TV, and soon on NNTV. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Explanation, Ian Holt is our guest. We're talking about Dracula this hour, www.draculatheun-dead.com. Tell me about your book. Well, um, it started in... Uh Actually, the journey started in 1995 when I attended uh, the First World Dracula Congress mm-hmm. in Romania, and I got to see, you know, stand at the at Chindia Tower where Dracula erected the forest to be impaled, 40,000 impaled Turkish soldiers, and I spent the night in Dracula's castle and uh, stood at the window where his wife threw herself into the river. If you've watched the scene uh, from Stoker's Dracula, the Coppola movie. Um, you know, I I, I toured toward his, pa- his palace at Tagovstay and and went to his house where he was born in Chigashwara. And um, from there, um, I met Dr. Elizabeth Miller, mm-hmm. who I understand is a guest on your show. Yes, uh, she's the she's the Dracula police. You know, she wrote everything about Brahm and Dracula you could imagine, and she checked everybody's facts. And she invited me to. Um, Dracula 97 in L.A., which was the 100th anniversary of the release of the novel. And I stood there in this room where they had all this stuff for sale. And there were like 20 or 30 sequels to Dracula. And not one of them had been a hit. And not Hmm. one of them had anything to do with the Stokers. And I said, well, where are the Stokers in all of this? They lost the copyright in 1927, circa 1927. And since then, they've been out of it. And I said, gee, wouldn't it be interesting? You know, I knew that Florence, Tom's widow, had worked on the Bela Lugosi movie. So there was a precedent for the family, you know, keeping Brahms' story alive and protecting it as um, after his death. So I decided to try and track down the Stoker family. And at, at, and at 97, I met, you know, Bela Lugosi's son. I met... Uh, Abbott Costello's daughter, uh, Costello's daughter, Abbott's son, and, and, and um, uh, I met Boris Karloff's daughter. So, you know, the, the legacy thing was in my head. And I, you know, over the years, met people from the family and started to form a relationship with them. And many of them were very jaded and didn't want to have anything to do with it. You know, they, they felt like Hollywood had taken it and run amok with it. And... Uh, and finally, I met uh, Dacre Stoker, and he was a young, he was a younger part of the family. He was an American part of the family. Um, you know, family branched out in Europe, and you know, Brahms director's descendants and Stone have the Stoker name because of the daughter that came from the daughters of the two marriage. They lost the name, but Brahm, uh, but Dacre's side of the family, and he's Brahms' great grand nephew, retained the name Stoker. So it seemed to be perfect. You know, when we when we met. And Dacre had written a paper in college about uh, 
the book uh, that his ancestors had written, and he was familiar with it. And uh, when I told him, I said, if we write a book, a sequel, we can reestablish lineage, and not only lineage, but copyright, form a new copyright, and reclaim Dracula for the Stoker family, it really lit a spark under him because he felt like he could heal the wound. He wasn't as jaded as the rest of the family saying, mm-hmm. oh, God, this is never going to happen. This is, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're so, uh, we've lost it and we're never going to get it back. It was like an open wound in the family. And he thought he could heal it like, like I thought. And I originally wanted to do the screenplay because that's what I am. I'm a screenwriter. I, you know, I've written nonfiction books, but I haven't written, I've never written fiction before. Um, so I, you know, I was going to do what I do best with the screenplay. But he decided that, you know, to honor Brown, we should do it as a novel. And, and that's how it started. We worked for the next five, we researched for two years and then actively started writing the novel. It took us three years to write it. It, it, it. With all the research that had to be done and getting to Brown's actual notes and interviewing, you know, the oldest members of the family for stories that their parents told them about Brown. So it was a it was a very intensive process, and a lot of the story, you know, what didn't just come out of our head, it came out of Brahm. You know, we felt like we wrote it with Brahm, and you know, some people don't understand. You know, and I think we've changed things, but you know, Brahm wrote in a in a in 1901 um, a, a forward to the Icelandic edition of Dracula that. A lot of the stuff in Drac in his book cannot be explained by science, and he fully expected one day that it would be explained and it would change the book. He's the one who came up with the idea that that everything that happened in Dracula was for real. He said that in in, in the Icelandic edition. He's writ- he wrote in other books that it was all based on Jack the Ripper and that Jack the Ripper was, uh, you know, and the murders were related to the Dracula murders. He wrote all this stuff, in, and that's where we got a lot of ideas from the book, from stuff that Brown actually wrote. In fact, the character of Cotford, Inspector Cotford, was on a list of characters that he put together in his notes that uh, Baker went to see at the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia, where 125 pages of his handwritten notes while he was writing Dracula um, are there, and a lot of subplots and stuff. The, the original text of Dracula was much longer than the book, and it was cut by the editor. So there's all, we don't have a lot of those pages. Only two chapters still exist, uh, and they were released separately under a title called Dracula's Death. Was, Brom, that, was Brom Stoker a, a Dracula, uh, a vampire? No, no, no. But here, here's why he chose the name Dracula, we okay. believe. Um, Brom was very sick as a child and he almost died. And they mm-hmm. had no, you know, we don't know what it was that he had. He was bedridden most of his childhood. And ga- in Gaelic, they call, they, it, what they, they called what he had, rock flua, which means bad blood. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing that 100% correct, so, but it, it sounds like that. Well, years later, his original title for Dracula, we have it in his notes. He was going to call him Count Vampire, which isn't very, uh, you know, Count Vampire. Mm. Isn't very uh, original or, or exciting. But he heard stories about Dracula, the real historical Dracula, and um, he heard the name, and the name sounded like Draculia. Draculia was what he heard, which is the uh, uh, Romanian pronunciation of the name, Dracul, meaning dragon, and Ya, meaning son of. And in Europe, the dragon is a symbol, I mean, in Romania, the, the, the dragon is a symbol for the devil in Orthodox Christian culture. The seven-headed dragon in the, in the um, book of Revelation. Well, he, he, when, it, when it comes back to uh, America sometimes in Europe, it's translated as son of the devil, and that's how um, Brom heard it. And he said, what a perfect name for his, not only did it sound like the blood disease that almost killed him, but it, it, you know, he thought the name meant son of the devil. And what a perfect name for a villain of his book. And that's how uh, it became Dracula. 
How can we tell if we're talking to a a vampire if we're out and about in downtown Toronto, downtown LA, or downtown Montreal, or wherever? What would be a tip off to an unsuspecting member of society that the person that we may we may be talking to may actually be a vampire? Well, I'll tell you. You know, you you don't know. You you know, um, you, if you see them at night. They're in usually, you know, some exotic dress. You know, um, they 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 usually dress in a crossover between, you know, the 1700s and, and present day, mm-hmm. something like that. And you know, you can always tell by their fangs. You know, they, a lot of uh, vampires. There's a, you know, there's a specialty in this. If you go online to some of the vampire sites, they'll, you'll see fangs, and they're special teeth makers that make real vampire fangs. There's other Vampires that go to the dentist and have their uh, incisors filed down to have fangs, so it's the real teeth. But why? You can usually tell. But by why? The fangs. What happens when they grow up and and hopefully so these I, are people that are grown up that do this. Well, you know, like what does that tell you? That it seems to me that these people are not playing with fifty-two cards in their deck. I, you know, I I've I've met them and I don't see them. I think it all grows out of trying to be different you know they they reject the um the, the, the tight rigors of society you know you have to dress a certain way you got to wear a suit and tie to work and all this stuff they, they reject all of it so so how do they you make know, a living um, how do they pay their bills if they're not part of society well you know uh, i'll tell you the truth i from from the vampires to walk out in daylight and since then you know, it's been changed. In fact, people that read Brahm for the first time today think that's a mistake. Brahm made a mistake. Well, in our book, we corrected and say vampires walk about, can't walk about in the daylight. Brahm got it wrong because Brahm's a character in the book and he learned about the story from, from someone. I won't give it away. But a, a vampire came up to me at one of my book signings and he was very upset. He said, you know, he's lived his life during the day having a job. And, you know, now that he, we found, he was the sequel, that Brahm was wrong and vampires can't walk about in the day, mm-hmm. he has to quit his day job and find a night job. And, his, and like so many of his brethren, he's going to have trouble paying his bills. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they find work. You know, I, look, I, I, I know a vampire who's a butcher by day, works at a butcher shop. Do you know any, do any vampires work for the Red Cross? You know, that's probably... <laughs> They <laughs> probably are free blood. Yeah. <laughs> are, are I you, mean, yeah, other vampires are working, you know, the night shift in hospitals to get blood. D- tell me, are you a vampire? No, no, no. I mean, I, I have had many vampires come up to me and ask to be blood bound mm-hmm. with me, which means you share blood and you become, you know, you're supposed to have a telepathic connection to the person you share blood with. Um, no. <laughs> I uh-huh. had to knock on my hotel room door at night, you know, track me down. But uh, no, I am not a vampire. Um, I'm a uh, friend of the vampires. Uh-huh. Um, I, you know, I can go to the vampire ball and <laughs> that, which I'm going to in New Orleans. So, so um, do you wear garlic? Do, do you wear a ring of garlic around your neck? Do you carry a crucifix and do you carry wooden stakes, silver bullets? Well, maybe the cru- maybe it would be the crucifix, <laughs> but that's it. And I, you know, I. I, I find that most of them, most of the vampires that I've met, are just regular people. You know, they 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 they're not um, they're not uh, how should I say aggressive uh-huh. or act this way. I you know I think they're theatrical. You know, I, I find a That's lot a nice of way them. Of putting it. Uh, yeah, they are. They make their own clothes. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're very talented, artistic people that somehow just want to live outside everyday society they're not they don't they don't agree with you know um with how our world works they think it's too regimented but but to does to stand out you know if you don't agree with with the way the world works uh does filing down your teeth or putting fang implants in and drinking blood really solve a problem no but did you know was it any different in the 60s you know what was it tune in uh, drop out and whatever 
it was the, the, the phrase. Yeah, but once Everyone again, once again, and flowers. but once another, again, but once again, we're talking about culture movement. We're talking about people who cannot accept responsibility. That's what it. That's what the bottom line is. They can't. They can't address or they can't attune themselves to the way society acts, the rules, regulations, and laws. So what they do is they form little cliques, little clubs. Yes. We're we're a bunch of outcasts. Yes. Get together. You know. I, you know. Yeah. I, I think it is. I think there's strength in numbers. You know. Um. You know. I I, I think uh, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the flower children movement and everything else. I mean, it was the same thing. I think. You know, for me, I mean, everybody has their little something that they rebel against. You know, um, my father, you know, was a haberdasher, and he had a, you know, a suit, cl- a suit store. Mm-hmm. I refuse to wear a suit and tie. You know, I, I just don't see the problem. If I can dress nice and yeah. come in and look clean, why do I have to wear the suit and tie? But it's you didn't my little way of, of rebelling. But you didn't file down. You didn't. Fi- you didn't file down your teeth into fangs, and you don't drink blood. Yeah, I mean, I think that. The drinking of the blood is, uh, is you know, supposedly, for them, you know, they say that it enhances their uh-huh. their physical powers. You know, and and since I've never drank the blood, thankfully, except if I got a little cut my finger, uh-huh. you know, and it was my own, um, you know, uh, I, I can't say whether it's true or not, you know, but to them it is. To them it's very real, and it's part, it's almost like a religion in a way, they it's sort of like they created their own religion. All right, stand by, Ian. We've got to take our final break. Ian Holt is our guest, Exo sure. Nation. We're talking about Dracula the Undead. His website is www.draculatheund-dead.com, or for our Canadian listeners, draculatheun-dead.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as the Exo continues from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name's Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. X-Zone Nation, Ian Holt is our special guest this hour. It's been a great hour talking about vamp, uh, vampires and uh, Dracula. Yes. X-Zone Nation, uh, Ian's website is www.draculatheundead.com, and that's Dracula the un- hyphen or dash dead.com. Uh, you just finished yeah. another film project, didn't you? Uh, we are. We just finished uh, my first producing project, and mm-hmm. I wrote it uh, with uh, Bleeberg Entertainment out of L.A. Um, it's called Episode 50, and if you're a fan of the ghost hunting craze, um, this is a faux reality movie about, uh, based on a true story about uh, 
day the kill hunters get attacked by the ghosts. <laughs> Not just getting evidence, but this time they actually attack. It is part of a true story. Mm. We're very excited about it. It'll be out next year. It stars uh, Kieran Elliott, if, um, if you know uh, uh, Spike TV's uh, Deadliest Warrior, then you know Kieran. And uh, it's uh, pretty exciting. Why do you think people are still are, are, are so fascinated about ghosts these days? No, it, it boggles my imagination. I think it's because if ghosts exist, then possibly God exists, and there's an afterlife, and we go on mm-hmm. after our death. And I think, and that's what this movie is about. It's it's about you know, these ghost hunting shows never deal with the implications of the evidence they collect and how it relates to our mortal lives and our... Well, that, that, well that's because most yeah. of the evidence that they collect is fabricated. Well, it could be, but, you know, I'll tell you the truth, and I had five witnesses. One of the places, we, you know, we did our research was at the uh, Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum mm-hmm. in West Virginia, and uh, they gave me divining rods, and I had a 20-minute conversation with a ghost. And I, I, I felt like you did, but until I've seen it, mm-hmm. and this wasn't just like the divining rods, Crossing for yes, and you know, separating a little by electromagnetic energy in the in the atmosphere. They went full east and west, o- open for no, and came back hmm. and closed for yes. Why didn't they and, just? Why didn't know, the ghost just talk to you? I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, you can, you can, you can say that they don't. That somehow they, you, you see these shows and you see battery drains yeah. and. Um, all these things in order for them to manifest. Yeah, but you see, I've, I've been in television long enough to know that there's many reasons why a battery will drain and 99999% have nothing to do with ghosts. I've seen batteries. How do, you, how do you explain? I've I've seen the, bad. I've seen I've, I've 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 seen batteries drain in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a on a ship. I've seen batteries drain in the middle of a hotel suite in Montreal, Quebec. You know, and I also know that electromagnetic fields are not uh, you know are are not strictly indicative to to the paranormal so there's a lot that has to be taken is 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 you know they say these crossing electromagnetic fields across crisscross the country in Mm -hmm. places like stonehenge and all this with high energy hey ian i hate i ian i hate to do this but we've just run out of time for tonight i want to thank you very much for joining me exo nation ian holt has been my guest when it comes to vampires i'm sorry i don't buy it one bit and ghost hunters now, you guys also need a reality check. Don't buy that either. Show me the evidence, like with UFOs, government conspiracies, and all that. Then I'll believe. I'll be back on the other side of the news. Don't go away.